This is a school with 80% of kids on free and reduced lunch. We have our challenges. We have kids coming with basically zero educational background, even in their own native language. I want to create a school where kids are not perceived as low achievers, but high achievers. I want to create a school uh, that prepare kids for the 21st century. The 21st century learning skills that we're really focusing on at Revere High School are really critical thinking and problem solving. There's also a big push for communication and collaboration among the students. And then finally, getting students to be creative and develop products, something that speaks to their learning and their way of understanding versus kind of this prescribed way, a product the teacher wants to see. I like how we negotiated and the timer finished. These skills are important today because most jobs don't just require you to sit somewhere and regurgitate an answer. Take out a little bit. You're trying to work with a team to find a new way to market something or to research a, a new technology. Being able to think your way through a problem and to solve a problem are very important skills to have to make you successful. That's good. That's awesome. So you want to try to do that again tomorrow? I've been teaching at Revere High School now for five years. I'm currently teaching ninth grade U.S. History One. What's up? We're studying the Civil War right now, the antebellum era. We're just learning about how the North and the South were growing apart. We're talking about the road to Civil War. We're going to do Civil War and Reconstruction. How did that help? When I went about preparing the unit, the road to Civil War, I really thought about what is the best way for students to learn about this topic? How will they engage with it? And come about it um, from more of a problem-solving standpoint. And then just thinking about providing multiple resources for the students. People tend to learn differently, so he tends to give us a few options to learn sometimes. Like he'll either make us read or watch a video because some people need something to watch and some people need to read. The Missouri Compromise admitted Maine as a free state and Missouri as a slave state. This is my 12th year teaching and this is a 10th grade honors chemistry class. This unit is on stoichiometry. They've been learning how to convert units of reactants in a chemical reaction into amounts of products. Okay, so do you all have your Ziploc bags from yesterday? Yes. When I start planning a unit, I need buy-in from my students. And if they are not interested or curious about what we're going to learn, then they're really just in their playing school and that they'll listen to what I have to say, they want to learn what I'm telling them to learn, and then they take a test and that's it. The likelihood that they remember that or that they use any of that information is usually pretty slim. And we tested the pH. So I try to find something very abstract sometimes that will spark curiosity. Um, I have a little video that I actually found from um, another teacher that I follow on Twitter. We're going to watch it and I want you to explain or ask me any questions about what you see here. Okay? And that's it. <laughs> if there was a reaction, why, like, if it's a gas reaction that's making it go up, why wasn't it leaking out beforehand? If it was gas, which are we all assuming that there was some sort of gas that made that happen? Yeah. Why gas though? What, what, give me, can you give me some more of the science behind that? What we're doing with the airbag is we're taking baking soda and vinegar and trying to get it proportionate to each other so that all of the reactants are going to be utilized and created into products and there won't be any left over. A real airbag that's made by companies, they have to have those measurements precise, because if they aren't, then it could possibly hurt the person using the airbag. And I think it's really cool that we're able to figure out how people are actually using chemistry in everyday life. Wait, 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 wait for it, wait for it.
To run my classroom, I really start from day one and make sure that the students get to know one another. So every day, they have a new group. And here are our new groups. Stephanie, Claudia um, from the east, Aaron and Ceci from the west. All right, so let's go ahead and go. One other tool that I use is when students are in groups, really making sure they have clearly defined roles. All right, so then we've got the leader, the scribe, the reporter. So a student can't really just sit back and not participate because they have a, a role to fulfill. Who's our leader over here? Aaron, you're our leader. All right. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our national conference. All right, you are all representatives of the House of Commons for Oceanopolis, and we are here to kind of settle our nation. The activity we were doing today was about making compromises. We were doing an imaginary activity where uh, the East and the West of some random country represented different morals and different views on how we should handle the economy socially and politically. We can't pay all this money if the tariffs are going to be this high. One dollar and fifty cents is the highest we're going to go. That's it. All right, how are negotiations going over here? Are we making some progress? One dollar fifty-five cents. One sixty. <laughs> All right, deal. Let's do it. Are you real? One sixty. All right. It's just ten cents above one dollar. Okay. I learned so much from other people. When you're paired up with different people, you're always getting different ideas each and every single day. What do you guys want? What's your goal? We want to prohibit indentured servants. Keeping the 80-20 rule in mind, 80% of the time being student-centered and 20% of the time being teacher-centered, has really readjusted my role in the classroom. Instead of me spending most of my time delivering direct instruction, I'm now focused on the one-on-one -on -one conversations that I get to have with students. Why? Because like, they'll have to sell their... Uh, I like the way that we learn because it's like student-centered, like I'm teaching myself more than he is. So timekeepers and leaders, do a quick time check. We're trying to do two more challenges. The other piece is really time management. I tend to be a procrastinator, but in his class, like I've, I've noticed in myself that it's improved. Like if I know if I pace myself in an easy manner, that I realize that I get more done. Keep the price at $10 per bushel. Have the price of widgets at $4. Ultimately, you're going to have to do a crash test, the airbag that you're going to make and the crash test itself. To facilitate a lot of the 21st century learning skills, I want the role of me as a teacher to not look like a teacher. I want it to be that I'm learning this with them and that they're almost teaching themselves. You know, get as far as you can. You can at least set up the calculation. That I'm That's such a powerful thing when they can all be in one room together and to learn something from each other instead of just thinking that they have to learn it from me as the teacher. She gives us background information. We learn about it. We are like knowledgeable about the topic, and then she sends us out to experiment on our own. She makes us talk about it, like to think with each other, and we'll keep coming, coming up with the answers, coming up with the answers until we finally get it right. Oh. Making mistakes is good, you guys. You learned it much better after you made mistakes. It's really important to have students share out their learning and their discoveries, their questions and comments. If at all possible, provide multiple ways for the students to demonstrate their knowledge. A test doesn't really show my learning. Every student has a different way of like showing like the way they learn, and I think the main thing is that they should give students options then the student's gonna pick the option they find is best suited for them to show what they have learned. All right, so let's go ahead and open our conflict versus compromise discussion, and you guys can take the floor.
the debates are what really stands up about his class. So why do you guys think that compromise is better than conflict? Well, compromise is best because it allows a quick and peaceful settlement between opposing sides and allows both sides to be somewhat appeased. I, I disagree with that because sometimes um, to make a compromise, it takes a lot of negotiation, which negotiations which can take a lot of time. Um, well, if you're trying to say that conflict takes less time when really things like wars probably take a lot more time, time as well as that. money. Yeah. But if you think about the war of Iraq, when there's people out on the street fighting, it brings more attention. You'll hear about more than compromise. Um, I'm about to take a picture of our um, chart. While I'm doing that, if you could um, score yourself on the rubric for right now. After every major assignment, whether it's a writing assignment or a creative project, I have students score themselves on the rubric. If you kind of brought some example or something into the discussion, that really helped. And a critical piece of that reflection has been the Harkness method. I'll sit in the back and I'll actually track the conversation by marking up a map of the classroom. And at the end of the period, I'm able to put a visual representation of the discussion on the board for students to see. How often did they speak? Did they speak too much? Did they interrupt one of their classmates? Did they ask a question? Thank you, Robbie. I am proud that I am able to participate right, so, a lot um, in the group debates, to, um, being able to express myself in a way that I've never been able to before. And I'm proud of being able to do that because I used to be nervous and shy and not like to talk a lot, but then like this really helped me open up and talk more and feel less shy and really be confident. Think about this for, for a second. Can you in like one succinct sentence tell me why the pH is important? First discuss with someone next to you and try to get it into one perfectly worded sentence. We had a test for harmful uh, products. products so rather. if it was below or over 6.5 and 7.5, then it would be dangerous to the person that would be in the vehicle. After we do an experiment, we always go back over the experiment and figure out what we've done wrong, what we've done right, and why that is and how we can apply it to that situation. All right, so again, Best pH would be 7. What does that mean? If it was a pH of 7, what does that mean? The majority of what I am trying to do in my classes is get them to really be thinkers. As much as I want them to learn chemistry, I really feel that being able to think in general, not even just think about chemistry, but think in general, is more important. I want to get all the gas to stay in the bag this time because yesterday it was just a little off. So I'm using a hair elastic to keep all of the um, vinegar out of the um, baking soda this time. So I can seal it and then have them buy. In the beginning of my high school, I didn't really want to know why things happened. And I feel like now, definitely, like if our teacher tells us this happens because of this, but why? You know, like I'm always asking these why questions. We have to like get it on ourselves and then that makes you 100 times more understand what you're doing. First first crash test everybody, with your luck. You're going to hold it to the bottom, it to the top, it's going to One of the things that we have done in the River High School is to create structures to support 21st century learning expectations. When you create that culture that everyone knows that one way or the other, he or she has been empowered, you will see real transformation taking place. One of the biggest transitions that the school helped teachers make is moving from the 54 minute um, teaching periods to the 80 minute teaching periods maybe come to a compromise, Don't, like screaming at each other, does that help or something? It gives you time to have the students really think deeply about the topic. What John Brown's act did was it opened the eyes to some people. All right, now onwards to compromise. Our school has placed a priority on implementing technology into the classroom, both through the use of teacher computers, smart boards, and our one-to-one -one iPad program. However, as teachers, we've really focused on not allowing the technology to be the driving force, but really the pedagogy. 
Everything we do can be done without the technology, but it's a really wonderful tool to have. Um, we're going to check off your compromises flipped lesson from last night, so I'll come around. Our school has done a tremendous work in the flip learning domain. On the flip lesson, Some people believe that flip learning is using iPads. No, a flip learning can happen in a class where there's no iPads. It's about basically moving away from the traditional paradigm of teaching and learning and embracing a more comprehensive type of learning that involves students as a decision-making agent. So we talk about flip learning, we talk about student-centered. The two things go together. Basically, instead of learning the material in the classroom, you'll learn it at home. So once you go, go into school, you have like a kernel of knowledge, like Mr. Willis likes to call it. So once we get into school, we'll do things like activities that are based on what we learned the night before. From my definition, I put in my own words, I said, one, two, or more sides get into a serious argument. We've rebranded our library into a learning commons. There's computer labs, there's booths for the students to work in, there's movable tables and chairs, and it's really become much more of an inclusive space for the students to go to. And it also develops those collaboration and communication skills. So I almost started looking at my class as a way to teach problem solving and critical thinking and use chemistry as a way to do that. I have found though that by doing that, my students are probably learning more chemistry than they've ever learned before because they want to learn it and because they're finding ways to learn it themselves. Six people haven't spoken yet. So. I find it personally rewarding to teach these students the 21st century skills because I know they're not only going to leave my class with the history content, but they're going to become lifelong learners. And they're going to have the tools and the knowledge to problem solve, communicate with their colleagues, with their bosses, and become a collaborator in whatever projects they're working on. I am responsible for my own learning and Knowing that I'm responsible for my own learning, I could carry this into the outside world. Personally, as a student, I like it better when you don't give us the answers right away. Like, make the students work for it. By letting them figure out the answers themselves, then they can utilize this skill that they learned in this class, in college, in work, and many other situations throughout their whole life. What type of learners do we want to produce? Do you expect kids to act as uh, empty vessels or you want them to react and be part of the process and uh, be an active learner? 21st century learning expectations requires a different type of learner, one that really engages in a rigorous work that can interact and be a participant in the content that he or she is applying.